If the delivery guy's busy, I might even show up to uh, to deliver. So <clears throat> there's uh, one thing we've in our discussion of stress this far that we've neglected, and that is the fact that the rocks. The, the things that we're interested that are under stress that we're interested in, the rocks, have pores in them, and those pores are full of fluid. Right? So, <clears throat> if I were to sort of <clears throat> imagine this is our little stress cube, where now I've, I've <clears throat> drawn the pores in there, <clears throat> and pores, of course, are full of fluid, and, th and that fluid imparts a pressure on the rock, right? If I were to then imagine what the stress is on some little piece of my cube, right? So now, now I have a smaller region I'm interested in, what the stress of this thing is, right? That, that right there. If I were to hold the stress, the external stress fixed, right? So let's just imagine our thought experiment here that all those errors I've drawn on the outside are constant, equal, right? I, I'm fixing this so that uh, externally, this cube cannot deform, right? If I then increase the pore pressure, right? So if I, if I increase the pore pressure, the pore pressure, um, well, fluid pressure, first of all, what, like thermodynamically, what is, thermodynamically, what is, what is pressure? What did you learn in there? Uh, no, thermodynamically. I'm thinking more like in terms of, uh, Just tell you what I'm thinking. It's, <laughs> it's the rate of change of internal energy with respect to volume, right? Yeah. Thermodynamically. So, internal, you know, partial E, partial V. Right? And internal energy is a scalar. Volume is a scalar. Therefore, pressure is a scalar, right? So, when we're talking about fluid pressure, it's always going to act on the rock in, in, a, in a scalar way, which what that means is isotropically. So the, the same pressure, you know, if, if I have in this pore some pore pressure, it can't be greater on this side of the pore than it is on that side. It's always going to act on the rock in an isotropic manner. Right? So if I have this external applied stress that's fixed, right, and I increase the pore pressure, then the density in this part of the rock is going to have to change, which means that the stress on any any little part of the rock that's not in the pore is going to have to change. Right? So therefore, I need some definition of stress that's not independent of pore pressure. Right? What Everything we've talked about so far hasn't included any discussion of pore pressure. But obviously, right, obviously, if I increase the pore pressure holding everything fixed, I'm squeezing the rock right there. This, the stress is going to change somehow. Right? <coughs> and so what we do, how we account for that, is with something called an effective stress model. So the effective stress, or what we call the effective stress tensor, is the stress due to tectonic motion minus the pore pressure. And again, because pore pressure is a scalar, it must act isotropically, meaning it can't impart any shear stresses, right? and so the part of the stress tensor that it act on, acts on is just the diagonal, the normal components of stress, and so if we were to write this in tensor notation, we'd have something like, you know, the tensor sigma is equal to the tensor S or matrix, whatever you want to say, times the pore pressure times the identity matrix. Right? So the pore pressure is just a scalar. <coughs> And so 
Uh, again, we'll try to be consistent with the notation in the class. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's consistent with what's in Zobach's book that when we're talking about tectonic stresses, we'll use S. When we're talking about effective stresses, we'll use sigma. <clears throat> Other times in, in the literature, um, you know, and, and try to be specific and actually use uh, the subscript effective. Other times you might see like prime to indicate effective stress. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so then, yeah, uh, if you just put those, you know, do the matrix addition there, or subtraction, then you have this as the effective stress, and then here's this to note that <clears throat> faulting depends on the effective stress. <clears throat> In fact, all of the mechanics we'll do in this class depend on the effective stress. <coughs> because if I hold, you know, often what we're changing in a petroleum engineering application is the pore pressure, right? We can't really modify the tectonic stresses. Like they are what they are. So they're applied externally, but we modify the pore pressure either by injecting fluid or taking fluid out, depleting, right? And those things um, then modify the effective stress field, and it's the effective stress field that governs fault slippage, that governs the, the strength of the rock. So, um, you know, we can actually, by depleting the reservoir, we can actually cause faulting. Right? So we can, because we're changing the strength of the rock, which could possibly cause the rock, rock to fail and cause faulting. Right? Likewise, in areas where we have existing faults, if we're injecting fluid and we increase the pore pressure, then we can cause those existing faults to activate or slip, causing induced seismicity. Right? You hear a lot about that. It's exactly what happens in Oklahoma right? or, or in the Barnett Shale also where uh, the wastewater from hydraulic fracturing activities uh, is taken to only a small number of injection wells, uh, and, and they increase the increase the pore pressure and cause cause the faults to slip. 